Well, Doc, it doesn't matter how many apples I ate this morning. I can't get away from Dr. Shalom Odier. Shalom, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. And I'm not lying about these apples either. I ate a lot of apples every single day, and I'm almost like dependent on these apples. Um, Dr. Shalom Odier is an expert in addiction treatment, and so I guess my first question for you, Doc, is what is the difference between dependence and addiction? And what is addiction? Addiction is repetitive, compulsive use of a substance despite adverse consequences. Mm. So you could be addicted to apples, right? Because you can you know, compulsively eating apples, but like the negative consequences of apples, it's going to be pretty minor, right? In mm. fact, apples like have quercetin, they have uracilic acid, they're fibrous, like they provide like a lot of nutrients and antioxidants to your body. So you might compulsively consume them, but you're not going to get withdrawal from apples if you don't have them. You're not going to start stealing to get apples. You're not going to lie to your partner just to go and get more apples, right? So apples provide nutrition and antioxidants to the body. Um, substances of abuse, they generate a lot of reward, a lot more reward than an mm -hmm. apple from the brain point of view. Neurochemically, you might get a little bit of a sugar high from an apple because it does have fructose in it, right? But it's like not going to compare to someone who might be using cocaine, methamphetamine, or any type of opiate, whether it's heroin or otherwise, that's going to hit your brain fast and probably cause about 2,000 times the amount of reward compared to an apple. Mm, okay. And then that's going to change your thinking and decision making because once you get that kind of high, you know, all of your brain starts to think about how can I get it again? When am I gonna do it again? You know, that level of pleasure changes wiring and decision-making in your brain. Mm -hmm. And so that's why people make decisions that maybe you and I would look at and think, how could they possibly wanna lose their job or their husband or wife and lie and use again? Well, the answer is because the biology of reward takes up so much of your brain, releases like 2,000 times the amount of dopamine, the currency of reward, that that starts to alter the brain and change the way people make their decisions. Okay, got it. So here's why I'm so interested in. So I have a family member that has gone through addiction um, and everything that you just explained had happened to him. Um, but what I was reading the other day is that heroin other than, I think, one side effect, it's not horribly bad for you unless you overdose. What would you say to someone like that who might be commenting on the feed right now and saying, heroin actually isn't that bad for you if you use it intermittently in the right way? Well, I mean, I feel like that's a very slippery slope, right? Because what I just described has to do with the way your brain changes as a result of taking in a substance that releases high amounts of rewards. In this case, it's an endorphin reward um, from heroin. And so once you get that reward, your brain changes and you start to make different types of decisions that you know, allow you to want to use it more and more and more. There are going to be a lot of people who are more predisposed to an addiction, some more than others, right? Uh, but at the same time, a drug that releases that level of reward creates a high potential of abuse for everyone. Mm. So it's really about those brain changes. It's not that it's gonna damage your heart or your blood vessels, right? It's not toxic in that way. It's toxic to the neurobiology of reward and the neuroadaptation that happens as a result of it. And then all the brain changes that go in the prefrontal part of the brain where all of the decision-making takes place. So your brain's like, I want that, I want it again. I want it again. And then you start to give up things you used to care about. You don't really care about working out. You don't really care about your job. You don't really care about your partner. Your brain puts all of its time and neurobiological energy towards seeking that drug out again. And because mm. it lasts, let's say, three, four hours, and then it goes away so fast, suddenly, once you're in withdrawal, not only do you not feel high, you feel horrible. Right. right. You feel worse than before you even did it. Right? And so then you want to just get rid of that feeling. So there's that level too, where all of a sudden you now feel substantially worse than before you even did the drug. And so your brain's even more like, 
we have to do this again, we have to do this again, I feel terrible, I'm like, my eyes are watering, I'm really restless, I'm anxious, my nose is congested, my body is aching, how do I get out of this? And Dr. Mandir, before we go a little bit farther, I don't think I did you justice on your introduction. Do you want to explain to your audience about why you're so passionate about um, opioid recovery and treatment in integrative medicine? Yeah, so I am an addiction psychiatrist, so um, double board certified in both um, general psychiatry and addiction psychiatry. And then my third specialty is integrative medicine. So um, I did fellowships at UCLA in addiction psychiatry, and then I also did a fellowship with Dr. Andrew Weil at the um, University of Arizona for integrative medicine. I also did two years at the California College of Ayurveda to study Ayurvedic medicine, and then I did the Helms UCLA acupuncture course. So a big part of addiction is looking at the whole person and different ways that they can be um, helped in order to get them through you know the initial stages the middle stages and the continuing stages of recovery not just narrowing them into some reductionist model of this is only a brain biological disease and so you know dr wild's approach is to look at that whole person and find different ways to help them cope in a biopsychosocial nutritional environmental and spiritual way and i think integrative medicine is it, it has the possibility to really flip healthcare on its head because it's it's so unique and it's so um, it, it focuses on what the mind, the body, and the spirit, and how you can actually help yourself. So it's pre preventative as well as it's it's something that you can do when you're facing these symptoms. Um, so I guess the first question, just to help people out, what is a drug, and when you take this drug, is it? the drug that's making you feel this way or is it the brain that's making that's altering your state of mind yeah you know i mean just like anything you know anything you take into your body like it has an effect on your physical body but it also like affects your brain chemistry so drugs have the ability to alter your chemistry in your brain in such a way that you create high amounts and levels of reward in a very brief time you could also have physical effects depending upon that drug of abuse, right? Where if it's a stimulant, your heart rate goes up, you might be sweating, you might start to have the feeling of anxiety, but at the same time, your brain is getting this like rush mm, okay. from all of that dopamine and adrenaline, and then people might seek out that rush again. So it's a physical and, you know, a neurobiological phenomena. And what is like integrative medicine's approach towards treatment and recovery versus traditional and conventional approach like Suboxone or any of these opiate blockers, anything like that? Yeah, so I mean, traditionally speaking, um, a lot of the where the medical side interfaces with the treatment of addiction has to do with like medication assisted therapy, which isn't right or wrong, but in our treatment, in our view, it's only one part of the pie, right? Because right. we're like bio, psycho, social, nutritional, environmental, and spiritual. So that's just only one of our many quadrants. So yeah, the medical side of it might be like using a substitution therapy like Suboxone just to treat someone's craving because you're giving them um, you know, a partial opiate agonist just to try and stop them from craving so that they can then focus on the rest of their life to get some coping skills and rebuild. And that's one way of managing it. Mm -hmm. In the Dr. Weil point of view, again, we look at the whole person and we try and individualize, you know, like at all points north, it's the same model. We're trying to individualize people's treatment approaches, looking at not only their biology, but their psychology, um, looking at you know, their emotional, if they have a history of trauma or if they have depression, um, looking at the nutritional side of things, looking at their microbiome, if we can make changes there, um, engaging them physically in things like exercise, mind-body exercises, like yoga, meditation. Um, we may even do things um, on the bio level that might help their brain recover faster, like NAD plus treatments, a vitamin B3 treatment that can also help your brain recover faster. Um, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is using a magnet, that also helps just strengthen the front of the brain where your decision-making is and your impulse control is. 
So we're trying to engage people on multiple different levels, um, as well as like community and spiritual to try and help them in their recovery. Interesting, yeah, because that was the, the main takeaway I got from speaking with Noah Nordheimer, the founder of uh, APN Lodge and APN Capital. You're saying, you know, when I walked in, they already knew what treatment they're going to give me before I walked in the door, basically. Um, same thing that happened with one of my family members, and that's the reason why he's been eight or nine rehabs. Um, and so, I guess for the next question after you, can addiction, or sorry, can substance use disorder, seven, uh, is there a cure for that, or should it be managed, like you're saying, individually, and how do we, how else do we do that? Yeah, so substance use disorder, it's a chronic relapsing remitting condition, right? So it's not like having a bronchitis that you treat and it goes away and you're done. You know, often people will say like, well, I'm not drinking anymore, so the problem's fixed. Right. You're like, actually, no, the problem is just starting. That's like, that's how you start the treatment. It doesn't just end there. That's how it begins, you know? My former mentor always used to say, getting off of drugs is good for a lot of things. Stopping them isn't one of them. Mm. Okay. You know, so yeah. what he's, you know, Dr. Lang is trying to say is that, you know, just stopping drugs is the beginning of the journey, not the end of the journey. And relapse rates are, you know, at three months, anywhere from 40 to 70%. At six months, they're 60% in some studies. 40 to 70% relapse rate in six months, is that what you said? Yeah, 40 to 60 at three months. Three. And then at six months, it can still be as high as 60%. And the, one of the only things that's been shown to bring that down is people remaining in treatment. Now, you don't have to stay in an inpatient setting the entire time. You just have to be engaged in some form of structured treatment for a longer period of time because it's a chronic disease model, not like having an acute pneumonia infection that goes away. So it's something that you have to take care of where the beginning of the journey is stopping and the rest of the journey has to do with like how to stay off drugs, learning new coping, developing yourself spiritually, finding meaning in your life, you know, in a structured sober setting. Okay, and so I'm trying to get people back home listening to this. If someone overdoses, and I, I think it's narco, narcane, narcone? Yeah, narcane. And that basically blocks the opioid receptors, but after that happens, their withdrawal symptoms are like, like 20 or 30 times worse or something like that. Right. Um, what's the chemical imbalance that's going on in their brain when someone goes cold turkey? Yeah, that's, that's probably like even worse than going cold turkey. Um, of course, it's necessary to keep the person alive. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're like we were talking about is that, you know, once your brain starts using drugs, you get changes in your brain, your brain adapts, it's plastic, you have neuro adaptation. So your brain gets really used to seeing opiates every day. And so as a result, you develop tolerance, you use more and more, your physical body becomes dependent on it, your emotional self becomes dependent on it. And then in a case like Narcan, you go into rapid withdrawal because all of a sudden those opiate receptors where that you've been like providing stimulation to, you suddenly block them all. Okay and then it rips the opiate off of the receptor, replaces it with itself, and you go into immediate severe withdrawal. And as a result of that, your body floods with adrenaline. And as you flood with adrenaline, you know, your nose will run, your eyes will water, your body will ache, you'll feel really horrible because your body got so used to and dependent upon receiving that opiate when you all of a sudden, you know, either stop at cold turkey or even worse, have to go through a Narcan recovery, you're gonna precipitate a really severe withdrawal. Doc, I've spoken to a lot of experts in this field. You are by far the most knowledgeable one. Why are you so passionate uh, about drugs and healing and, and alternative medicines? Well, I think, you know, when you take a disorder like substance use disorder and different psychiatric conditions, some of psychiatrists too, where there's no cure, you know, there's a way to manage it, um, a, then people tend to look outside of the box because they're sort of forced to look outside the box, you know, because standard treatments are not providing that much recovery. And so that allows for someone like me who, you know, believes in doing acupuncture, learning meditation, yoga, all these different ways of healing to be incorporated and people are a lot more open to it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, 12 step recovery is a spiritual path, you know, at its deepest root where people are, you know, they're identifying their powerlessness and they're trying to connect to a higher power. So I have always loved the aspect of it that engages people spiritually. 
And you know what they found is like at 10 years, people they've asked who have remained sober for 10 years, what is the main reason you're still sober after 10 years? And up to 80% will say they had a spiritual experience and that changed everything. That's interesting. I've heard the same thing about hallucinogenics and I'm being completely serious about yeah. this because yeah. I've read a report on um, the Wall Street Journal and they had like a 40 or like, again, these are anecdotal numbers yeah. of, but it was like 40 to 60 percent recovery rates from people suffering from addiction by taking a mushroom or a tablet one time. Do you have any similar studies or any background in this information and uh, why isn't this being talked about more? Well, you don't need a drug to have a spiritual experience, right? right? That's kind of like one avenue, right? Towards like allowing yourself to open and letting your ego dissolve to find a broader sense of meaning. But like a place like All Points North, the way I see it is you're in this environment like with the mountains and nature and you're learning to meditate and you're connecting to nature in a way that allows you to connect to a deepest part of yourself. Right which really obviates the need for like taking peyote or you know i using ibogaine to help people to get off different substances there's that is a path we actually include that in our textbook but it fits somewhere between the biological model and the spiritual model it's kind of a little bit of both because in some ways like ibogaine treatment can help your brain recover faster and people can have a spiritual experience with it for example but at the same time you don't need that what you need is a program that will allow you to have the spiritual experiences within you because that's deeper and long lasting you know if you use ibogaine they have really high relapse rates with ibogaine too because it fits in the bio you know it's a little spiritual mm -hmm. and it's a little bio at the same time so if you don't do the full spectrum, it's harder to have a recovery, which means you're doing emotional recovery. You're, again, treating people's spiritual self, their emotional self, as opposed to only trying to change their brain through microdosing of peyote or something like that. So I think it's, it's being at a place that inspires you to go deeper, whether it's through nature or meditation or yoga or a deep therapeutic experience that you connect to something larger than yourself. Right. And you definitely don't need drugs for that. Right, so it's that individual approach. It's different for everybody. Right. Here's one option here, peyote might be another. Um, but even like talking about myself, it's still like uncomfortable. It's still like difficult to talk about. Uh, and I think that's kind of a big problem uh, that we're facing today because I think Noah said it best that in 2017, it was like 72,000 people uh, had died from an overdose. 80% yeah. uh, of those were cut with uh, uh, benzos. Um, and that's more than you know, the Vietnam War, that's more than um, guns, car accidents, yeah. suicides combined. Um, and it's affecting everybody. It's affecting many people's families. I don't know too many people that don't know someone that's been affected by this. Um, but it's really hush-hush. Uh, when you come in with, with an approach like this, with integrated medicine, um, this holistic approach, uh, even acupunctures, um, is it difficult to sometimes be taken seriously about the mass pub public or anything like that? Are there any challenges that you run into when you come up with this out-of-box thinking that's backed by evidence, like a ton of ev evidence? You know, I think because um, conventional approaches have not been very, they're beneficial, but they're not beneficial enough people are a lot more open. And I also think mm -hmm. that people who are in recovery, they're just a lot more spiritual and they're really trying to understand because life has thrown them into the spiritual crisis that has affected mm -hmm. all the different domains of their life. They're a lot more open. I often find that people are just grateful that you know someone isn't just giving this, them one, there's only one way to do it type of approach and is examining them from like all these different vantage points and trying to help them feel supported and well. Uh, because most relapse prevention programs, again, they just have a very linear approach or a one or a two-step approach. And here, we, you really need like as much of a buffer as possible and to be able to help people find what works best for them. And that's going to keep them motivated to stay on a recovery path even when it's difficult. It's really hard and challenging if you're trying to squeeze everyone into the exact same box. I mean, and there was a study that basically looked at different psychosocial approaches to addiction to say, well, which one's more beneficial? 
12-step facilitation, cognitive behavioral therapy, or motivational interviewing. And what they found is they were all equal. But there were some people, the more like intellectually type people, who did better in cognitive behavioral therapy. Hmm. You know, so kind of understanding where people's strengths are can also help you like match the type of therapy that might help them feel the most motivated. You know, traditionally with cannabis use disorder, you know, the rates of recovery are often very low. And, you know, standard ways of approaching that type of disorder have failed, mm. right? So motivational enhancement therapy has been shown to be the most effective. So, you know, by substance, there might be an approach that's better. By person, there's going to be an approach that's better. And it's trying to match those things so you have the highest likelihood of the person staying engaged because it takes time to get better. Like we talked about, it's a chronic disease model. It's not, oh, I stopped using. I'm done now. Actually, you just got started. Right. And you do motivational anything, correct? I do motivational enhancement. I do yeah. cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy. What are some of the questions or conversations you have with somebody to get them motivated? Well, the first is just assessing if someone, what stage of change they're in. So, you know, they're there's been research and a change model for behavioral approaches. And you know you have to first identify if a person is in pre-contemplation, like they think there's nothing wrong with them. Person might be in contemplation, hmm, there might, I might have a problem, I'm not sure. Maybe they'll be in action stage and they're ready to do something about it, right? Um, or, and then it's just like in a maintenance model where they need to continually stay in it. So you can't treat everyone who shows up to treatment like they're in action. Because at least half of those people are not in action. Right. You know, half of those people may be in pre-contemplation, but that doesn't mean treatment doesn't work, right? People always say like, oh, well, you have to be in action stage and motivated to recover. And the truth is you don't. You have to get in the door and we're there to help you get motivated. We're there to find something in you that's going to help you realize, even if you're in pre-contemplation and we move you to contemplation, you know, you, that might drift you into action. That's movement. But if I treat you all like you're in action and I just punish you for not participating, we're going to be stuck. Right. So you got to have that mental flexibility within your treatment model to make space for people coming in wherever it is they are and treating them there instead of you're here, you must be in action states. Because we all know how many people leave treatment every day. Right. If that were true, that wouldn't be happening. And, and that's the thing is like, my family member, like, there are days like, you are doing so great. I couldn't be happier for you. But at the end of the day, I just know it's just, it only takes one thing that can set them off and they can go right back down that path because I've seen it happen. Um, you know, we spend more per capita than any other nation for healthcare and our, our services kind of lacking. What would, like, what's your advice? What would you say? Um, that the United States needs to do in terms of health care um, to advance this and decrease these uh, overdoses? Well, I think there's a lot of layers where intervention can take place. You know, there's the mm -hmm. prevention, primary prevention level, right? Was, you know, when the AMA told all the physicians they needed to treat pain in 2002, and if they didn't treat pain, they were going to be held accountable. You know, that set off an entire, like, cascade of, you know, a lot of primary care practitioners feeling all of this pressure to treat people's pain, but they only have 15 minutes to do it. So what happens? Right. You know, you end up giving everybody Vicodin and Norco, and then these stronger painkillers came on the scene, right? And so part of it was that healthcare delivery system of looking at things in such black and white terms. You're either in pain or you're not in pain. And so all this pressure on the doctors to get people feeling better and out of pain fast Right? The only way you're going to do that for people who have chronic pain is you're going to end up using opiates, which don't even work that well for pain, by the way. Really? That's another lie. So, like, you know, very brief time. And then over time, what happens with chronic exposure to opiates is that you actually become hypersensitive to pain and your pain threshold actually goes down and that keeps you more dependent. But part of it was that model that came up of like, you have to treat everybody's pain but the medical model only offers you this short amount of time to do it. So that's like one level, is like changing the messaging. So many people have chronic pain, including in that model is like doing a more holistic approach towards treating pain. Even if that's like engaging other providers as part of being like an integrative 
approach where you have an acupuncturist, a massage therapist, physical therapy, you know, you may even do hypnotism or you may have, you know, a pain psychologist helping you learn to live with the pain you have rather than saying you got to get rid of it. Right. That pain at zero is the goal. You know, we set these like very unrealistic goals as far as what pain was going to do. And then once again, they under, didn't understand the degree and severity of how addictive these drugs were. So that entire system approach, you know, really needs, and it, obviously people are looking at it. There's monitoring systems now that are set up that really need to be nationalized. We have one for the state of California, so I can see if you went to five doctors and you already got pain medicine, okay. and you're lying to me and saying, no, I don't have any pain right. medicine and I have like L3, L4 issue, I can go on the computer and I can see like, actually, you just got it from this right. doctor, this doctor, and this doctor. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So the cures monitoring system is helpful. Again, like looking at people more holistically when they have an issue that may require the management of pain so you're not just using opiates, A, for every kind of pain, and then taking the most dangerous opiate and giving it to lots of people when your pain might be at a four. Right? So monitoring, uh, much more integrative approach, thinking about safety, not just efficacy, right? Because there might be a lot of different medicines that treat pain, but am I gonna give you the strongest, most addictive medicine when you have a toothache? And I can give you ibuprofen, and you can put a cool compress on it, and you can gargle salt water, that type of thing. That's what I wanna ask you about next, because that same thing happened to me. And I had some knowledge and experience, so I didn't take it, but it's like these doctors are passing out like candy. I mean, I, I think the average time it takes for someone to give someone a prescription for a diagnosis or diagnose a prescription, it's like 13 seconds. That's how fast they do it. And I remember not even having a choice if I wanted to get prescribed uh, oxycodone or not after I got my wisdom teeth pulled. Um, and I was just forcefully given it. <laughs> I, I got a whole, uh, uh, what you, a canister of pills, I don't know what you call that. But, yeah. And there's like 50 pills in there. I don't need 50 pills, it only lasts a week. And I just toughed it out and had salt water and I just did like the you know, ibuprofen. But just that alone is incredible that they're just passing out. Why do you think that is? I think, again, like in this healthcare delivery system where we're just trying to like treat people in 15 minutes, we don't really want to like think about our choices. They're, don't want somebody calling them complaining of pain. They're just going to give you the strongest thing that's going to keep you quiet kind of mentality because they have so many people they have to treat and they're in an insurance model that is requiring them to see volumes of people in order to make their ends meet. And so they want to spend less time. And there just wasn't the consideration additionally of like, okay, it's not only what works, it's what's safe. You know, thinking about like, is that safe to be handing out like, really strong opiates for every single kind of pain, even when it's minor, you know, that really wasn't entering people's psyche. And as of 2002, everybody thought, well, I'm just gonna use the biggest hammer. That way, like, I won't get any trouble for like not treating people's pain, you know? And now that has to be like, well, if you do that, you know, then they could end up addicted to it and they could end up in a cycle where they end up losing their life and everything that their life means to them. So now you have to think about, like, does every ADHD need Adderall? Does every anxiety need Xanax? The answer to that is no, but how many people come into me and that's the first thing they say is like, well, I have ADHD and I want Adderall. Like, first, I don't even know if you have ADHD. Right. And again, based on safety and that being a drug that people highly use and abuse and has a high potential for addiction based on its pharmacodynamics and kinetics, you know, are you going to take the strongest, most dangerous drug and use that as your first line therapy? And it's the same thing for anxiety. That's why you see so much Xanax right is because you know people started getting xanax for every kind of anxiety they ever had you know actually xanax was shown to cause euphoria and the company knew that when they released it hmm. not only does it relieve your anxiety it causes euphoria it has a very short half-life so when it leaves it leaves so fast and then your body has more anxiety than it had before you even took it very often and so you can get another cycle where you're treating the you know, anxiety you have from not being on Xanax with more Xanax and you can develop rapid tolerance. Mm. So, you know, again, these like safety considerations really weren't in the equation and the way people are making decisions, they just want to make people feel better fast. Okay, safety, not efficacy. Yeah, and like 
again, like other treatments for anxiety are not necessarily less efficacious. They just might take time to build up and you have to be patient mm -hmm. and go to cognitive behavioral therapy, 60 to 70% effective. Maybe mm -hmm. you take an SSRI. Maybe you learn deep breathing and meditation. Like you look at it, the whole person, maybe there's something in your diet. Maybe there's too much caffeine and that's causing anxiety. You have to look at the whole person and individualize it, not just hand out Xanax like it's candy because it's a five minute thing and it's going to make you happy. And, I'm, and now I think I'm finished. Right, right. And I wouldn't put it all on doctors either because yeah. a lot of patients, including the family members and other people I know, right. they go in and, oh, my back hurts. I need this. I need this. I need this. And the, right. the doctors go, okay, well, here you go. Um, but the question is for me now is the actual pill itself. Like when a new medicine comes in or a new approach comes in, for people listening, how do we know that's not BS? And what's the process um, that this pill needs to go through before it gets approved? Well, that can be a long journey. Right. Um, and again, when you're talking about medications to help people in their recovery process, you know, there's generally like substitution therapy, like buprenorphine, which took probably 10 or 10 years or so to get out to market. Mm -hmm. By the time they got done like testing it and they had to do a phase one trial, phase two trial, phase three trial. Phase three is really when you're looking at dosing, not just efficacy, um, dangers, things that can happen to people if they take it. And a drug like that that was controversial took even longer to come out. Um, now they have like probufine, which is uh, implant of buprenorphine, suboxone, so that you, okay. you know, obviate the need to like monitor people taking it because it's in there for three months. And that probably took a good seven to 10 years to finally come out mm -hmm. from development. So they can take a long time. I think you should probably, it's good to wait like a year because oftentimes, sometimes they'll rush drugs through, especially when it's a condition that's killing people and they don't always know like what the downstream effects are gonna be for people in terms of side effects. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most important with all the drugs in that class is like, how does your body metabolize Suboxone? How does your body metabolize Naltrexone, which is the blocker? The blocker of all opiates, Naltrexone, also comes in the intramuscular form that lasts a month called Vivitrol. So for one month, all of your opiate receptors are blocked. It matters how you metabolize those drugs because the side effects of those drugs, if you don't metabolize them well, say your liver is a slower metabolism of that drug, then the drug is gonna build up and not break down at the expected rate and you'll get a lot of side effects. So I think it's really important when you're gonna take a long acting, whether it's probufine, which is the implantable form of Suboxone or Vivitrol, which is the blocker, the antagonist, and you're gonna have a monthly injection as to very important in an individual sort of way, know how you metabolize those drugs by checking, you know, your testing, your genes, to look at how your body breaks that down through the 3A4 pathway. Otherwise, it can be a miserable experience. And that's why I think doctors like you are so important because I feel like I wouldn't even know myself that well to know what I need and don't need. Right. Um, what are some symptoms, if I'm a parent at home, I have a child who might be using, but I'm not entirely sure. What are some symptoms that I should be looking for in them? Well, if, if you're a parent at home, you know, then you probably have someone who's in school or dependent, you know, you want to look at if there's like changes in the way they're functioning at school. Are their grades going down? Who are their friends? Have they changed their friend group? What's their behavior like? Are they having more mood swings? Are they more erratic? Are you catching them in lies? Have they become more aggressive? Do they look like they're excessively sleepy sometimes and then staying awake and playing video games till four in the morning, three or four days at a time? You wanna look for those behavioral changes, um, the change in the types of people that they're hanging out with, changes in their performance at school and the way that they relate to you. Or if you find them, you know, they're often lying to you or might be stealing money from you, making things up to get money from you and then finding they never actually bought the thing they promised to get. I would say looking at that spectrum of issues might help you identify, you know, a child who might be abusing substances. And, and Noah said on the podcast too, a couple months ago, he said, um, you know, I don't think this really became a big issue because he's got a concerted care group in Baltimore. And he said, I don't think this really became a big issue until it reached the suburbs. Um, is there any patterns that you know of in the home life, uh, whether 
whether it's an abusive family or anything like that, is there any patterns that may cause a child or someone to um, start taking a drug like this? Yeah, well, it is complicated. I mean, the genetics are one factor, right? Say they account for like 25-ish percent of what becomes you know, someone who is walking into the world with a predisposition and then you have environmental concerns, right? So one in part of an environmental concern like might be growing up in an abusive home and that's been shown over and over again. If you grow up in a traumatic environment, you have a much higher likelihood of developing an addiction and at a younger age with more negative consequences than someone else. And abuse could be physical, verbal, sexual, or even neglect. You know, your parents are never home. They're not paying attention to you. They're not watching what you're doing. They're not setting any rules. There's no boundaries. So, you know, then you're gonna find your support elsewhere, which might be like going out into the neighborhood and connecting with other people who don't have parents who are monitoring them. And so, you know, getting involved in a group where, and then there's a lot of need for attention and often that attention will be negative. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having a history of trauma, whether that trauma is physical, verbal, sure. emotional, or neglect, is, it's, it is one of the risk factors. Having a psychiatric disorder, whether it's ADHD, is overly represented in addiction. There are higher rates of people with substance use disorders who have ADHD and who have bipolar. So again, the approaches to managing and treating those can be integrative and holistic. It doesn't have to be all medication, but having those disorders make you more likely to have a substance abuse problem. Is substance use disorder a disease? Yeah, it is a disease. It's a disease on a lot of levels. You know, it's a neurobiological, physical disease. It's an emotional disease. Um, and that way, I mean that um, it affects your decision making. It affects, you know, your reward cycle, right? It's a disease that affects how you relate to other people. Maybe you become more isolative. Maybe you hang out with people who are more aggressive. So it affects you emotionally. Um, it's a disease of the spirit because it takes everything from you that has ever meant anything to you. And then you just feel empty inside. And then you've created all this damage and you don't know how to repair it. So you want to just kind of keep using because it's like you feel so empty inside that, you know, there it's difficult to cope feeling that way. Mm -hmm. So it's a physical disease, it's an emotional disease, and it's a spiritual disease. Well, Doc, it's been a pleasure having you on today. We've covered a lot today. We've covered some integrative medicine approaches. What is a drug? What is addiction? Uh, what symptoms should you be looking for um, in your son or daughter in the, at the home life? And lastly, is it a disease? Um, and on behalf of Real Leaders and all the you know, families watching this at home who have been affected by uh, substance use disorder, we just want to thank you for being here. Thank you for taking your precious time to speak with me. Um, so I guess the last question we have for you, we are Real Leaders Magazine. Uh, what is your definition of a Real Leader? Um, I think a Real Leader is someone who has a vision and they are willing to take on a challenge like the current ways of doing things in order to be a benefit to large groups of people in whatever way that is required. And I think, you know, you have to be brave and it takes courage along with that vision in order to make change in the world. So that would be my short definition of a leader. I appreciate your time again. Any last words where people can find more information about your services or where they should be going uh, to learn more about what you're studying right now? Um, well, yeah, I do have a private practice, um, and my name is Dr. Modir, so our website is, you know, um, drmodir.com, and you can read about uh, some of the more holistic approaches. I also edited a textbook for Dr. Andrew Weil, um, the integrative, it's called Integrative Addiction and Recovery, and it is for healthcare professionals, but also a lot of families could make use of learning. We cover all the major different substances of abuse. We also cover all of the tools integrative tools that might be helpful on that journey to recovery and there's a link um, as well as like other links to treatment services on our website wonderful well you're here to hear from dr shalom adir thanks for being with us i'm kevin edwards and to everyone listening at home always keep it real